Uh, my name is Ed Pritchard. Uh, I am one of the hosts of this webinar series. I'm with Miami-Dade County uh, Parks Department, Miami Eco Adventures. Um, we're excited to have you here tonight for another um, great conversation. Um, we uh, will be doing these conversations. If you're unfamiliar, we do these every year, um, every second Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. And that's uh, August through May. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, everyone in this webinar is currently muted and we have your videos off. Um, we ask you guys to remain that way. Um, and if you have any questions, we definitely want to uh, we want to have them and we will answer those at the end of the session uh, during our Q&A. Um, so feel free to type those into the chat box, which you can find on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. And we will take that time to uh, ask those questions at the end. The webinar is being recorded um, and we will send that link out um, uh, a couple of days after the presentation so that you can share that um, with anyone that wasn't able to make it. Um, we also host these on YouTube, um, so that way they, they live somewhere and you can always reference them uh, on there. Uh, if you want to uh, find out more about these webinars, what the upcoming topics will be for the fall, um, you can follow us on social media. Um, we'll link those at the end, but it's at Miami Eco Adventures and at Miami Dade Sea Grant. Um, you can also receive an email reminder. Uh, Anna is going to put her email in the chat. Um, and you can reach out to her and get those uh, topics and the links. Um, now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our tonight's speaker, Anna Zangronis. Anna, take it away. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're going to jump right into this. This is probably my favorite webinar that I've done in this series because it's about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. If we haven't met before, my name is Ana Sangronis, and I'm the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent for Miami-Dade County, which is part of the University of Florida's Cooperative Extension Service and Miami-Dade County Parks, Rec, and Open Spaces. And so by day, you can find me in my office or in my car, usually with some coffee. And well, it's not really by night, but on the weekends and any opportunity possible, I am underwater. I am an avid recreational diver, a volunteer diver, and a semi-professional diver in that I do get to use this skill for my job and contribute to scientific data collection. And I'm lucky enough to do this here in our fantastic state, which hosts the third largest barrier reef in the world. And the Florida Coral Reef is the largest in the continental United States. And if you look at this map, the reef track starts here out by the Dry Tortugas, Dry Tortugas National Park, and continues throughout Monroe County, up into Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and Martin County. And all in all, that's roughly 300 miles of reef, or about the distance to drive from Miami to Jacksonville. So it's a really large area. And as you can see, from the different colors featured on this map, there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen when it comes to management of this reef. And I'll touch upon that a little bit later. Florida's coral reef has a tremendously high economic value for our state. We're talking an asset value of eight and a half billion dollars, 4.4 billion in local sales, 2 billion in local income, and lastly, over 70,000 full and part-time jobs supported by our Florida Coral Reef. Unfortunately, as is the case with a lot of our natural areas, coral reefs are facing a multitude of threats, both anthropogenic or human-driven, as well as natural threats. And here in Florida, some of the major events that have affected our living coral cover include the diadema sea urchin die-off that happened in the 1980s, as well as a major disease outbreak of white band, which killed quite a bit of our very charismatic staghorn and egghorn corals. We've also had two major coral bleaching events in 2014 and 2015. And it's important to note that since there are natural threats, but the anthropogenic or human-induced threats 
often amplify those naturally occurring threats. And so I'm gonna be focusing for our purposes today on physical damage to reefs, specifically those that are caused by visitor impact. And while scuba diving and snorkeling isn't necessarily considered a consumptive use or a consumptive activity on a coral reef, there are there is data to show that there are negative impacts associated. It's not a passive activity. And that brings me to this term of best practices or best management practices. And I will probably, you'll hear me use those interchangeably. And the term best management practices or BMPs was developed for the agricultural industry. And BMPs are these practices or processes to balance sustainable use as well as protection of a resource. And this covers both things that can be done as well as tools that can be implemented. And these, again, from, for an agricultural standpoint, this is really looking at being an effective and practical approach to prevent or reduce pollution sources to achieve more improved water quality. And within the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service, there are BMPs taught in with two large programs. The first is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, which targets residential homeowners with making choices about planting in their landscape and proper irrigation approaches. And the Green Industry Best Management Practices Program which specifically targets those commercial users, those agricultural producers, pesticide applicators, et cetera. And whether we realize it or not, all of us, I'm sure, on this webinar right now use best management practices in one way, shape, or form. We just probably have never quite thought of it in that way. And some really easy examples include using sunscreen when we're going to be out in the sun for a prolonged period of time implementing the use of protective clothing to better cover and better protect our skin and reduce the need for sunscreen. Using bug spray when we're gonna be spending time in natural areas that might not be treated. Drinking lots of water to stay hydrated on hot days. And also consider things like what we do to prepare for hurricane season in terms of stocking food and batteries and water, et cetera. These are all best practices. Now we're gonna turn these best practices and look more specifically at how they apply in the aquatic environment. So the first thing I'd like to shout, to shout out or recognize are mooring buoys. And mooring buoys are usable by private boats or commercial boats, and whether people are snorkeling, fishing, or diving. And a mooring buoy is this blue white ball with the blue stripe that's connected with a line down to a permanent anchor on the bottom. And that permanent anchor on the seafloor with this buoy attached provides a, a great, <laughs> that's a great convenience frankly, because it takes away that need to drop an anchor. And so without dropping that anchor, there is the reduction of anchors banging into or dislodging or harming corals, soft corals, and other marine life. And especially when you consider areas that are deeper water or high current or both, that reduces the potential loss of your anchor as anchoring in those areas can be really challenging. Anchoring is easy, retrieving your anchor is harder. And so what ends up happening is a lot of tugging and tug of war and a lot more damage. So these mooring buoys are a great tool that are free and widely available to use. And I wanna just make that point clear because when I'm out on the water, I frequently run into boaters who don't know what they're for. And they think that they're marking a protected area or that they're reserved for science, but no, these are intended to be used by anyone in a boat. Before I address practices that are addressing reef impacts, I first wanna talk about safety. And this is applicable whether anyone is snorkeling or diving or just jumping in the water, but that's to use a dive flag. 
And this is really important if you've ever been out on a boat and been in a body of water, whether it's a bay or an estuary or the open ocean, seeing people can be really challenging. So that dive flag is the number one visual alert to other boaters that people are in the water. And the, that dive flag being deployed requires boaters to be idling, motoring along at idle speed within 300 feet. And so this is one example here in this photo, but typically dive flags are displayed on the boat and they have to be visible above the highest point of the boat and from 360 degrees. So in this example that I'm showing you here, there's a dive flag on the boat, but there was also an additional dive flag that the snorkelers were carrying in the water. Continuing on with these safety practices, I have to mention that using the buddy system is really important. And you are looking out for people literally and figuratively. And this means keeping visual contact with your buddy, whether there's someone you know well, or someone maybe you got paired up with on a trip, and you're, you want to get an idea of how they move in the water, how they respond to being in the water and on the boat. So that way you can be alert for any signs of distress or that they might need your help and vice versa. It's a reciprocal relationship. If you're in the water by yourself, you want to make sure that you have some sort of float or surface marker attached to you. And when I say that, I don't mean this awesome spring break float, although that's certainly fun and very visible might not be the most practical type of float if you're trying to do work in the water. You're really gonna want this more streamlined torpedo shaped float like you see on Baywatch, if anyone remembers that show. Now, the first things to consider as best practices for snorkelers are evaluating your level to snorkel. You don't have to be a great snorkeler or excuse me, a great swimmer, but you do need to be able to swim. And so whether you are the Olympian in the pool or the lifeguard or somewhere in between or not even close, you want to evaluate your level of experience as well as comfort. And depending upon that, you're going to look for a dive shop or a dive site that is going to suit those levels and what, you're, you, what you think you can handle. And additionally, when you can, you want to try and play with your gear on land before you even get to the shop or get to the water, if possible. If you're using gear that you purchased, I recommend removing the protective film that's on the inside of your mask. You can burn that off, which sounds a little scary, but if I can do it, anyone else can do it. Those long, clicky campfire lighters are really good for this. You want to test that mask and make sure it has a good seal so that way it's not potentially flooding on you when you're out on your trip. And also just get yourself acclimated to breathing through a snorkel because it does feel different. It's not like breathing air through your mouth or nose. So you wanna get used to that before you even get on your trip. Now, once you're getting ready to get into the water, you're going to be needing to wear a flotation device of some sort. If you are in on any sort of charter trip, this is going to be mandatory. And these can be, they're very low profile. If you're a pretty comfortable swimmer, you can make sure that they are deflated so that you can dive down if you want to, but you can also inflate them with some air to keep you comfortably on the surface. So not only is this a safety feature for you, but this also enables the captain or the crew to be able to help visually track you more easily while you're in the water. If you feel that that vest isn't enough or if you're on a private boat, you can use things like pool noodles. These are pretty cheap. They come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And if you're really, if you really got some grit about you, you can probably find one on the beach for free and you don't even have to buy it. But you could use this in concert with the, with the flotation device or on its own. And that will help keep you buoyant and give you a place to be able to rest a little bit when you're moving around on the water. Now, this next image is probably the most important and that's your body position while snorkeling. If you will observe in this photo, this snorkeler is nice and horizontal. He's flat, parallel to the surface of the water. 
Generally speaking, being vertical in the water just doesn't work so well. You create a lot of drag, you can't really move forward, and you're more likely to tire more quickly. And being vertical is going to put you in closer contact with your fins and the reef. So being flat on your stomach with your head in a pretty good neutral position and keep that snorkel pointing up so that way you are breathing air and not water, These, this is paramount. And the last thing I'm gonna mention on this slide, and this applies to everyone, is no touching, taking, or harassment of marine life. There are licenses that you can obtain to collect specimens for aquariums, but that is generally not permitted if you are on a, a recreational or a charter trip. And they also don't include things like these sea stars that you see here. So leave it alone, leave it in place, enjoy it while you're in the moment, take a picture. As we discussed with the snorkelers, divers can also take a few best practices before they even get in the water. And the first is to consider what's your training? Are you an open water diver? Are you an advanced open water diver? Do you have a nitrox certification? And this is important. It's not just the level of training, but it's also your experience. I have met people who are paddy dive masters, who are terrible divers. And I have also met people who have their open water diver and have been diving for a couple of years and they are excellent in the water. So it's not necessarily the level, but also your experience to factor in what you're going to do, what trip you're going to take, where you're going to go. Also, this is something I see <laughs> not happening in the greater dive community, and that's keeping a dive log. A lot of divers will do this for their first few years in diving. And then after five or 10 years, they're like, ah, I don't need to keep a dive log. Well, this is something I strongly recommend. Not only does it allow you to easily remember dates or when you did something, where you went, but it allows you to re-enjoy and revisit that memory. I also like to use it because over the years, things change. I have gained weight. I have lost weight. I've dove in cold water. I've dove in warmer water. So I keep my dive log very, very detailed. That includes not just the site and the depth and my bottom time, but also water temperature and what thickness wetsuit I was wearing, whether I was using steel versus aluminum tanks and how much weight I was wearing. So that way, if those same conditions present themselves later, I can go back to my dive log and have a pretty accurate starting point of what I should be wearing in terms of thermal protection as well as as actual lead to help sink me. You wanna plan dives that are appropriate to both your training level and experience. And most recreational dive shops have pretty strict guidelines about this, but you're gonna take into consideration whether you wanna dive a shallow reef, something that's 30 feet or less, a deeper reef, do something like a drift dive. If you've ever been up to the Jupiter area, those tend to be deeper. They're very high current. They're very complex dives. Or if you're going to dive an artificial reef. So thinking about all these things, doing your research, and if possible, taking a refresher course if it's been a while. I want to address some of the diver's impacts on the reef. As I mentioned in the beginning, Diving and ecotourism activities have traditionally were considered to be no impact. However, studies that started coming out in the late 1990s and early 2000s were proving that to be untrue. And so there are negative coral reef impacts associated with scuba diving. And they might not seem like a lot at the time, but the concern is the cumulative impact of contacts or damage over time, that's where we get really concerned. And divers impacts can be classified into direct and indirect types, direct including breakage or damage to the actual coral skeleton, as well as tissue abrasion. And also from an indirect standpoint, there's sediment disposition or the movement of sand particles onto the corals, which can actually smother the animals. 
And all of these leave these coral animals, any type of injury really leaves the coral open and highly susceptible to other issues like bleaching and disease events. Camp and Fraser conducted a study in Key Largo over a three month period. And they found a whole lot of really interesting information. They went around and mystery shopped, if you will, dive boats in the Key Largo area. And they had a whole bunch of different parameters that they were evaluating. And within that study, almost 100% of divers made some sort of contact with the reef. And out of all of those divers, only two had no contact whatsoever. They found that the average touches of the reef were average 17 per minute in a one hour dive. And then the average touches specifically to stony coral was just over four per minute. And the graph that you're seeing indicates that from those observations, most of the interactions occurred at the start of the dive within that first 10 minute period of the dive. So this is the time when the divers enter the water, they're getting their bearings, they're checking their buoyancy, they're making adjustments to their gear. And something else that was observed in this study was that a lot of the entry points for the dive were located over the top of the reef. So the part of the reef that comes closest to the surface, which is also where a lot of the branching corals like the staghorn and elkhorn corals are located. And similarly, this graph that you're seeing, which reflects the total numbers of contacts, the second graph that I just showed reflects the same type of thing in which stony corals also receive the highest number of contacts in that additional, that preliminary part of the dive. And one of the big recommendations that came from this study was the use and integration of different educational tools and approaches to raise divers' levels of awareness of their potential impact on reefs. So now we're gonna continue into more best practices for divers. And one of those includes to actively listen to the dive briefing. If you are on a commercial trip, there is the general boat safety briefing, and then there is also a site-specific briefing in which the dive master or the captain will give really useful and relevant information as to the site, what to expect, current conditions, etc. And it can be really easy to get complacent. As with any skill that we do, we can start multitasking and maybe not paying attention, thinking that, oh, I know this, I've been here before, I've been diving for 20 years. But it is important to actively listen and pay attention so that you know what's going on with that site, where you are, when you are. Before you want to get into the water, you want to make sure that you're, seclude, you're securing all of your gear that might be loose. And this can include your gauges, your backup regulator, compasses, cameras, etc. So that way nothing is dangling underneath you as you are swimming. When conditions allow, when you enter the water and you'll do that initial weight check to make sure that you're properly weighted, that's also a good time to make sure that your gear is working. Check your inflator, check your deflator, make sure that your camera isn't flooding while you're still at the surface. And usually, again, conditions permitting, this probably wouldn't work on a drift dive in Jupiter, but on a shallow reef dive, you probably do this, making sure that all of your ducks in a row before you're getting to the bottom and then trying to deal with them underwater, under pressure. When you descend, if possible, you wanna try and find a sandy patch. And if you need to get down there, cop a squat, make your adjustments, cinch up some of those, those snaps, make sure everything is good, but you wanna do this in a sandy area where there is no living substrate. If possible, and this is situationally dependent, don't wear gloves. And there are some statistics about gloves that I'll, I'll mention in another few moments. But if you can get away without wearing gloves, that is definitely a preferred best practice. And lastly, 
checking your body position and where it is in relationship to the reef. And I'm going to spend a few more minutes on this particular topic. And how does this look? Is there the right way? Is there a right way? There's the wrong way. Well, we know we don't want to be vertical, but there are better ways to do this. And so I'm going to give you an example here. In this photo, we have the diver on the left. I can speak for the fact that she's in the water column. She's not super close to the reef. But you can see that she's almost vertical. And maybe she was doing this because she wasn't close to the reef, but she's vertical. She's dangling. So if she were not so high up in the water column, she could potentially contact the reef. Here in the center, we have the next diver. She's a little more horizontal, but you see that her knees are still dangling down. So that could be a point of contact right there. And then on the far right, we've got the third diver who is in a very streamlined position where no body parts, everything is in, no body parts are close to the reef. She's in one straight line. And this particular position is part of an approach taken by this organization called the Global Underwater Explorers. And this GUE approach is what the University of Miami's scientific diving class models. And so this class teaches a lot of really important skills, namely focusing on buoyancy, trim, and being stream streamlined. And these photos are from a screen grab, and I apologize, they're a little challenging to see, but all the participants who take this class are filmed and reevaluated throughout the course of the semester. So you can see here that this diver is hanging out more towards the bottom, the body's all over the place versus later in the course, they are in this more streamlined position and same with the example on the right. And this is, this is the ideal position. And the main objective of the UM scientific diving class is to take recreational divers and make them occupational divers, or in other words, really focus on their form and function so that they can capture scientific data underwater. And it's hard to do that effectively if you're still trying to figure out your weight or if you're vertical or if you're needing your hands to move you around in the water. Another more recent study that was performed in the Florida Keys by Krieger and Chadwick found that divers wearing cameras or using cameras, divers wearing gloves or those wearing gloves and using cameras substantially increased coral contact. And that makes sense if you think about it, if you've ever been underwater. I mean, just like if you're wearing a glove, you're more likely to feel comfortable touching something that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. This is why, why, why I wear dish gloves when I wash my dishes and the same applies underwater. In this study, Krieger and Chadwick also found that participants, commercial boats that were part of the Florida Keys Sanctuary's Blue Star program had substantially less coral contact because they received that extensive dive briefing. And this study recommended an extra or tailored briefing for those using cameras, wearing gloves, or both. Interventions performed underwater by either the guide or the dive master. And that could mean either having that individual, the, the leader, address an issue with the diver in between dives, or if needed, if there, there's about to be some sort of major cat catastrophic contact, physically moving the diver away from the reef. Additionally, they recommended having the entry points for the dive to be staged over sandy areas when possible to try and reduce that risk of divers descending right on top of the reef. If you're not familiar with the Blue Star program, this is a program that was started in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in 2009. It's a voluntary conservation focused sustainable diving educational program. And the shops that choose to participate are evaluated. They're evaluated upon their initial joining of the program. And they also get evaluated annually to make sure that they are covering all the points in the briefing, that they are working with divers, that they are making sure to provide educational materials. 
Participants in this program take an initial training and also have to do an annual refresher, as well as participate in different forms of continuing education on a quarterly basis. So this is, it seems to be highly successful. I've done some interviews with Blue Star operators in the Keys, and all of them indicated that they're very proud to be a part of it. And for a lot of them, they get business as a result of being a Blue Star operator, which is a pretty big driver for some folks. Since Blue Star is proprietary to the sanctuary, which is on the map here, this area circled in white, the northern section of the reef track circled in pink, that is managed by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's Conservation Coral Reef Conservation Program. And in 2016, the coral program had a community planning process in which management recommendations were put forth to address different impacts to the reef. And one of those recommendations was the creation of a similar pro program a la Blue Star. And so this is a project that now is finally starting to move forward. I have partnered with the DEP coral program in interviewing Blue Star operators in the Keys. We have held focus groups with dive shops in the northern section of the reef track to see what their level of participation and interest would be. And overwhelmingly, it's very positive. So we are moving forward with investigating options for the creation and implementation of a similar program in the northernmost section of the reef. So that leads us to our wrapping up points, and that's what can you do? And first of all, first and foremost, tell others about some of these best management practices. Practice your skills on a shore dive or shore snorkel. Up in Northern Palm Beach County, we have the Blue Heron Bridge, which is extremely popular. It's a super easy entry point for snorkeling and diving. That's a great place. There are also several locations further south, including Lauderdale by the Sea in north to mid Broward County, and even off of Miami Beach, you can shore dive. And these are great places, less pressure, more flexible to practice the skills that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And I say this all the time, I am not endorsed by NAWI or PADI or anything like that, but to pursue more scuba or free diving training pursue those higher levels of certification and really work on sharpening those skills. And if the GUE approach is something that interests you, you can look them up at Global Underwater Explorers because they do teach classes in their methods. And I will also push, make the plug to take classes to learn how to identify the various creatures underwater. And not only will this make your dive or snorkel experience more enriching and more interesting, we tend to have a higher level of commitment to something when we understand it and know what it is. And all of the studies that I looked at indicated that it's highly unlikely that a lot of the people who made the contacts, number one, that they were unintentional, or, but lar more, more largely that they didn't know what they were contacting. So learning stony corals, learning sponges, learning fish, these are all gonna be things that just amp up your recreational experience and also make you a more solid and aware reef user. And I'll also make a plug for the upcoming South Florida City Nature Challenge. This is an annual event. It's a four day bio blitz. And a bio blitz is an event in which members of the community catalog different species, the number of biodiversity in different areas. And so this has been going on for a number of years and it's essentially a competition with other participating cities and observations of both plants and animals are entered into a platform called iNaturalist. And this exists as a mobile app, it also exists as a platform. And all of these entries on an annual basis are reviewed and compiled into this catalog of biodiversity for Southeast Florida, which will allow scientists to look at data and trends over time. And something I know is that 
The city nature challenge is always lacking in underwater observations. So if you have a snorkel or a paddleboard or like to dive, you can also contribute to this. You just need a camera. And our final thing that I wanted to highlight is why do we care about all this? Why does it matter? Well, I mentioned tourism at the beginning, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the other things that we derive from coral reefs. And that's all of the ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are goods or services that the environment provides to humans, and we don't pay for these. And coral reefs in particular are our, on the East Coast of Florida, number one natural buffer during major storms like hurricanes, the coral reefs help slow down and manage wave action and wave energy. There are also a number, a numerous amount of recreational, spiritual, and aesthetic values associated with coral reefs. We like to spend time there, being in the water and looking at fish and sea life that is really good for the soul. Additionally, coral reefs support and provide habitat for major recreational and commercial fisheries in Florida. So that we have to have to count that in as well. And I just like this pretty picture that shows one of the shallower reefs in the Keys with boats moored up because it's just, I mean, how could you be in a bad mood around that? So there is a lot at stake here. There's a lot to lose and we all have a role in which that we can play to help ensure the longevity of this particular resource, both now and into the future. At this point, I'm gonna ask Ed to launch a poll with one question. And I'm just asking you to indicate your level of agreement with the following statement. I learned something from watching this webinar. Your choices are A, strongly agree, B, agree, or C, disagree. And we're gonna leave that open for another couple of seconds. If you don't mind using your mouse to make your selection, we'll leave that open. And there are a good number of papers surrounding this very important topic. So if any of you are interested in them, I can send you copies. And I want to thank you all for attending and listening. And I hope you're staying dry. And I'm really happy to take your questions at this point.